Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second day at Parent Revolution. Um, so uh, we're here on a really important topic. This is the most popular topic that I get and um, going to give away a lot of important information. Again, I mentioned this yesterday. If you have not already started a notebook where you're going to keep track of all of the strategies, the tips, the information I'm going to be sharing, you want to do that now. You want to have either notes open on your computer or maybe a physical notebook, you know, something that just, you know, you, you use for this purpose because uh, truly uh, you can save a lot of money from what you're going to learn here. All right. So, um, you know, as we get started, uh, I want to say that yeah, our, our purpose today is to introduce you guys to three different types of financial aid, help you understand what these different categories include, and to um, give you ideas about how to maximize uh, so you're not having to overpay for tuition. Uh, now, here where I am based in the Los Angeles area, uh, my clients will, you know, sometimes have backgrounds and incomes that they assume wrongly that they're not even going to be able to get any type of financial aid. That isn't true. Uh, there are merit-based financial aid options we'll talk about today as part of what we do. But I thought we'd just start big picture. And uh, I wanted to share with you uh, how much college costs these days. So I guess the question I would ask you before I share the answer to that question is, how much do you think it's going to cost uh, for your student to go to college. Okay, so you've got numbers in your mind, you're, you're imagining, you know, a lot, right? You know it's a big number. Uh, well, it's gonna depend on the type of school. So here we can take a look at uh, the average tuition um, this past year, this uh, 2020 to 2021 year. And as you can see, uh, the range is, is really very broad. Public schools in state uh, at the ranked colleges. This was uh, done at USA Today using the ranks uh, that we see in uh, US News and World Report. Um, so those top 100 colleges are averaging $9,687 per year. And then you have your public in states at a little over 21K. And then you've got your privates, uh, which are uh, certainly, as you can see, they're uh, quite a bit more expensive. So uh, with those numbers in mind, uh, it's important more now than ever to understand what are some of the other um, ways that you can, you know, bring those numbers down, bring it, bring it down so that you can afford it. So let's uh, now talk about student debt. Again, big picture. Uh, we're going to talk about how, first of all, the fact that we have really hit a, a crisis in this country um, nationally around student debt. You've probably seen that in the news, right? Uh, $1.6 trillion in student debt is currently on the books. Um, and that is through federal loan programs in, in DC. Now, when you hear a number, I don't know if you're like me, when I hear a number like that, I'm like, okay, 1.6 trillion, I, that, how many zeros is that? That's a huge number. Um, how do I wrap my brain around that for strategy for myself and, and my own, you know, um, students that I'm trying to support? So let's uh, look at how that breaks down uh, for individual students. Here's what's going on right now, you guys. So we've got, 44.7 million people. So that's not money. The money is 1.6 trillion. Uh, we've got 44.7 million students with, with loan debt. And the average student loan that you can see there, $32,731. That is a massive amount of debt for a young person to have as they're trying to begin their lives. The, the realities of these numbers, really we have to orient ourselves to what is going on um, with, with the financials before we start talking about the three types of aid. So let's just jump into it. Here we go. Uh, we're gonna talk about the first type of aid uh, and that is need-based aid. Now, the timeline for this, if you are the mother or father of a senior, 
on October 1st, the FAFSA for the next coming year will open. You want to mark that day on your calendar. You want to put that on your on your phone and on your calendar app and remember to apply for the FAFSA as close to October 1st as possible. You can do it later, but it's a good idea to get it done as close to October 1st of the senior year as you can. The FAFSA um, is uh, the form, it's the federal aid form for student, uh, student support. And that FAFSA at FAFSA.gov, so that's F-A-F-S-A, gov you can go there the student you know we, typically the student and the parent need to do this together because what they're going to ask for is uh, your prior prior year of taxes so um, you know there's no sort of fudging it they're literally looking at what went in on your federal taxes and saying okay here was your income uh, here is how many people are living in your home here is a number that we're going to give you and what they give you is a number and you'll want to write this down it's called an EFC and that is your estimated family contribution so the EFC number is a really important one because that is uh, something that the colleges look at when they're determining whether you have need by their criteria and it is something that the federal government looks at in terms of your ability availability toward uh, loans, right? So are you able to access uh, some of the different types of need-based aid? So I'm gonna run through a few of these very quickly. Uh, there is a Pell Grant uh, and the Pell Grant, you can look that up online, P-E-L-L. -L. The Pell Grant is for students from lower socioeconomic status. The parents usually are you know, in the bottom quartile of income, but that that is money uh, that is a grant, not a loan, and it is something that has helped a lot of lower SES students access school. Unfortunately, so many kids who could apply for Pell Grants don't. So if you happen to be you know, a parent of a student in that category, really encourage them because that's what that money is there for. Now, more, much more common for, you know, like middle class and, and upper class kids is, is they, they end up with Stafford loans. So a Stafford loan comes in two forms. There is the subsidized Stafford loan and there is an unsubsidized Stafford loan. So, um, you know, if you're able to, it's really helpful to have uh, the subsidized loan. That means that the government is paying for the interest on that loan. An unsubsidized loan is given, but it is um, given uh, with interest. They're not subsidizing the interest. You're paying the interest, uh, which uh, up until recently is still at 6.8% interest on these loans. So just know that it's not, you know, a loan isn't free money. A loan doesn't go away. A loan is, it, it's not dispersible. I mean, I can tell you, you know, you read, uh, you know, a lot of interesting stories in, in my field of, of work as a college access specialist, but there are people who have gone through bankruptcy and even all the way to stories of people dying and like student debt somehow still showing up on a ledger. So you've got to really take this seriously for your student. Uh, if the student is going to take a Stafford loan, or if you are going to take, and let me just uh, caution you here, uh, a PLUS loan. So these are parent loans through the U.S. government, PLUS, P-L-U-S. Um, these are not recommended by most people uh, who do what I do. Um, I, I will say that the interest rate is high, um, that the terms are not favorable to the parents. And, you know, this is one woman's opinion, but uh, I would avoid the PLUS loan. Um, you can look at other types of loans, even from your own bank, by the way. There are private loans. If you have need and you want to go through uh, your bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, there will, be, there will be student loan programs and they will look at your credit rating and they will structure a loan for you. And that is something you can do. Uh, but again, those loans will be uh, quite a bit higher in terms of interest typically uh, than the ones that come through the Stafford program. You need to be organized. You need to have prior, prior year, two years of your taxes ready to go, know what your, you know, your gross income was uh, and be able to, you know, fill in those numbers accurately because uh, they do check them. Uh, so second type, let's move on. Number two, uh, merit-based aid. Now this is, this is where I get very happy because this is the thing that I specialize in helping uh, families uh, attain. Merit-based financial aid uh, is 
aid that comes directly from the institution where your student is going to attend in most cases. And merit-based aid is, uh, this is, this can be, uh, well, I can say on average for my clients, you know, $35,000, $40,000 and up in free money that does not have to be paid back. Um, but merit-based aid is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, the student has to merit the aid. And, it, you know, when we're thinking about the competition, especially for selective schools, the question is always, well, how, how do I do that? How do I, that sounds great. I want to get, you know, I'd love $40,000. Sign me up. Okay. So uh, there is um, an unfortunate tendency, and we talked about this yesterday. So if you missed yesterday's live, uh, please go back. You'll find it on our Parent Revolution um, in our Facebook group there. There is a, a recorded version of that that will stay there for, for a while. I'll leave it there and eventually it'll come down. You want to be able to see what I was talking about in terms of grade inflation and the fact that so many schools are giving away so many A's. And of course, students are earning the A's as well, but uh, the there is a, a flattening of the bell curve. There are not as many C's or D's or F's so, you know, it, it becomes difficult for the admissions officers and the financial aid officers looking to give away merit-based aid to di differentiate and say, yeah, my student, you know, uh, that I'm looking at right here, I, I want to give this student X amount of money on the basis of that. So let's take a look at one more thing that I wanted to share here. And this is a formula uh, for merit-based aid. We want to see honors courses, um, hopefully starting uh, by the ninth grade, and AP or IB or college. The, some students are doing community college classes as early as ninth and 10th grade when they're doing uh, what's called a dual transcript submission. And that's a strategy that I teach as well that we can talk about. Um, the, G the GPA gets very high when students are taking numerous weighted courses. So when you're every time your student takes an AP or an IB, you know, these 4.0 A average, uh, very commonly, you know, what happens is your student's going to be competing with kids who take on a lot of rigor if you're trying to get them into very selective schools. And those selective schools, you know, a lot of kids will come in with a 4.5 because they had so much or the 4.8 even, you know, you, you see some really uh, strong performances at the college's those are just people like us too, and they have a job to do, and their job is to keep their business running and make sure they admit people that uh, can afford to stay all four years and that can thrive, uh, not just survive the uh, admissions process, but thrive in the academic environment once they get there. So the GPA with course rigor is what I wanted to emphasize there. And then test scores this year, oh my gosh, all the seniors this year, um, it's been so interesting to hear them and their parents uh, because in some ways uh, they really feel uh, like they dodged a bullet, like, oh my gosh, you know, everything because of the pandemic and we can't go into a building and take proctored SATs and ACTs. Um, almost every school in the country went test optional this year. Um, does that mean they will stay that way? Probably not. Um, and does that mean, uh, as I talked about yesterday, uh, that, that there are, were no test scores submitted? No, it does not mean that because many students did still find a way. Some parents were taking their kids, you know, all over the place to get to a place where they could take the exam um, and and submit a score, even though it was optional, right? Um, but again, the colleges are looking for you know some firm way to compare apples to apples. Um, that for better or for worse, that's why they like um, having those exam scores. Even the APs this last year were really interesting. Um, the APs were done, I don't know if you saw that in the news, but they were done on the um, on computers, right? Because students weren't doing it in their schools because by spring we were already in the first, um, the wave of the pandemic. So um, the AP scores were not distributed across a typical curve like they have been in previous years either. And so again, from the other side of the desk, so many of my friends, colleagues, staff members uh, who have worked or currently work in admissions where at, at these schools where they're deciding who to uh, admit, uh, they are, 
they're aware of all of that. You've got yeah. me uh, sitting by to, to answer questions for you. Um, my goal is that we'll grow this to uh, a situation where we can have uh, as much sort of mutual support and encouragement, celebrate each other's victories, uh, watch each other's kids get in and, you know, we can all uh, be so happy for one another. And, you know, as we think about, you know, some of the, the things that we're covering today, the merit-based aid is really something where you've got it, you need to get in this when your student is young. Uh, this, the GPA is cumulative, it does start in ninth grade. And in some cases, they want to see seventh and eighth grade for the following two classes. Let me just give you a great tip for middle school. For those of you who have middle schoolers, get ready. You want your student to be starting foreign language in seventh grade. Typically, this will be Spanish 1A and Spanish 1B or French 1A, 1B in seventh and eighth so that they're in the second year as they start ninth. This allows them to get to AP level in that foreign language in their senior year. Okay, so that's a really uh, important one. Secondly, in math, please, if you can, if it's appropriate for them, get them into algebra one in seventh and eighth grade, one A, one B, or pre-algebra and algebra one. So they're hitting ninth grade in geometry. This allows a sequence where their PSAT is stronger in 10th grade because they're already doing algebra two. They are able to, they get to 11th grade, they can be doing pre-calc. They can get to calc A, B, and B, C if they are going to be aspiring into any of the STEM-based majors. So seventh and eighth are very important, but that GPA is critical. So many parents have kids who are dealing with low GPAs in ninth, sometimes through 10th, and then it's like, oh yeah, but there's an upward trend. That's That can cost you merit-based aid because the cumulative GPA is gonna be looked at. So even if they're like, make it to a 4.0 or higher with AP courses, that you're still averaging in those lower numbers. So the time, this is why, you know, I'm uh, as the founder of uh, the company who's sponsoring us, you can see Valley Prep Tutoring. There's no sales pitch here, <laughs> don't worry. But um, I will say that, uh, you know, you wanna get them the support that they need um, so that their GPA stays strong starting at ninth. Do not wait because it's money out of your own pocket later. Uh, and also it's your kid's confidence, right? You want them to be confident. Um, let's go ahead and look at our third category. I'm gonna be giving you some URLs in a moment. Uh, so you do, again, wanna have your pen, you wanna have your notebook, you wanna, you wanna be taking notes with the information that I share here. Um, I'm very strategic and I am very um, sincere in my enthusiasm to help you and to help your student. And so I'm giving away a whole lot of stuff here because I want you to grab it, write it down and implement. You and your student and your, your family need to decide what is the ROI here? What is the return on investment of that time? Um, I'm gonna give you three websites uh, that I think would be worth your time to look at. And the, uh, the first one uh, that I'm gonna mention is fastweb.com just the word fast and the word web together, .com. Fastweb.com is a reputable scholarship search tool. And uh, there you can go in and see what your student may be eligible for. Um, the second that I'll mention is uh, capex, C-A-P-P-E-X.com, uh, another very respectable tool. So uh, Red Kite is another tool. So I'll mention those three. Um, I just wanna say, uh, as we kind of wrap our time today, that whether you are looking at one or two or all three of these types of aid combined, again, what we've done today is we have explored three types of financial aid. The, the massive important point to take away from this is making sure your student has the academic confidence to know that they can afford to aspire uh, is absolutely critical. So this group, uh, if you're seeing this on another channel, please find us and join this. This is a private exclusive Facebook group. And this is uh, at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash parent revolution. And I'll put it at the bottom there so you can see um, where you can find our group. This is where you'll be able to connect with me. Uh, if you have specific questions, uh, I'll be there to answer those. You can ask questions here in comments when I go live and I'll be answering those. Um, I think that one of the real 
privileges of my life is getting to help people. You know, sometimes I never even get to meet the people. Very often they end up uh, wanting to engage me and, and have me work one-on-one -on -one with their students. That is something that I offer. You know, I'm an essays coach. I help build the list. I help through the financial aid process. I connect people to my tutoring staff for the GPA support. And, you know, I've got tutors that do all that. Um, and, and I just love it because um, I know as a mom myself, how important it feels for you. I know that this, like nothing matters more. And, you know, it's, it's just really, uh, I think a fun thing for parents to come together and like put our heads together and figure out how to help our kids usher them through this uh, rite of passage.